My next guest today is a man who has had an extraordinary life as a bookmaker and has been steeped in both the greyhound industry and the horse racing industry for well over four decades. But he will always be most famous for being the man who stood to lose when Frankie Dottori rode the Magnificent Seven 25 years ago. He was braver than all when it came to that final Mount Fujiyama crest who came home and he lost a personal fortune amassing around £1.4 million. But he, he used that pivotal moment in his life and career to rebuild that career and became one of the best-loved television faces working with BBC and Sky. And he is still plying the trade that he knows and loves best, uh, standing at Chelmsford City, amongst other places, and just recently went back to Ascot for the first time to stand in that pitch since 1996. He is, of course, Gary Wiltshire. Gary, great to have you in the Luck on Sunday studio. Yeah, good. Good morning, Nick. Fantastic. Thanks for inviting us. 25 years old. Oh, it doesn't seem like that, does it at all? Unbelievable. So you, there's been a, a very eventful life <coughs> subsequent to the, the Magnificent Seven, Fantastic. but to what extent... Did that day completely define you? Has it completely well, defined you? Well, I thought it was a day that made racing, and also it made me, it made Gary Wiltshire, because I was only a very, very small bookie. That day, I remember, I shouldn't have even been there, Nick. I was on my way to Worcester, and I lived in Little Allwood at the time, just outside Buckingham. Had a lovely house, you know, ex-training. Uh, Dudgeons used to train there, Sandy Dudgeon, and it was opposite the point to point, quite a Little Allwood point to point. And I was like a little J.P. McManus saying, one day I'm going to buy that house opposite. And I was only a barrow boy, remember, because my mum and dad was in the flower game in Level Lane Market in Oban. And my first experience of bookmaking was point to points, mm. which we was only just saying at Tweezel Down and all the shot. And I, I loved it, you know, I loved it. And uh, that day, I, you know, there was a big traffic hold up on the M40. So instead of doing a right, I rung up my clerk who lived in Swindon, Peter, out. And I said, Pete, we ain't going to make it for pitches. So I said, tell you what we do, let's go to Aska. It looks a really hard card. I think my float I had as a player, what I had was maybe just under three grand. And I said, if we can go and win three or four hundred quid, we'll get a day's work. It looks really tricky, the card. And he said, yeah, all right then. Anyway, he went one way up the M4. I turned up, went up the M40. Never, still never had a pitch at Ascot that day. In them days, you couldn't buy pitches, Nick. It was from, you, it was handed down from, if granddad died, the son had it, if not the grandson daughter if you love it the only daughter who got it was uh Anthea Redfern who Bruce uh, Bruce, Bruce Forsyth Forsyth was wife, married yeah. to yeah and uh that day I got there and well I think we, we you got to be there an hour before the race to get the pitch in we got there about 50 minutes before and I said to Pete oh we're all right Pete there's two empty pitches at the end of the row and uh we got on first five races very quiet there was when I mean good bookmakers in them days on the rails you had Victor Chandler always beautiful suit and love you know in them days bookmakers you looked down nick and you looked at them and thought oh like i was as a kid i used to love to, i'd love to be a bookmaker they were suited and booted they were beautiful you know proper not now you go to the race course now they're wearing jeans it's ridiculous what they do now what they allow and we got on that day the first five i think the first five races i was winning about three or four hundred quid which like and then all of a sudden i smelt it out after decorated here i won the fourth race I said to Pete, if the next one wins, faithfully, we've got a chance here, Pete. And he was looking at me and thinking, but don't forget I've been bought up buying flowers, buying boxes of roses from Covent Garden Market for whatever, and trying to double my money. I had a flower shop in Grazing Road opposite the Sunday Times, uh, Valentine's Florist. And I was a, not a wheeler, you know, but I always in my mind thinking, can I get a few quid here, can I get a few quid here? And uh, anyway, when Lock Angel, I prayed to God Lock Angel to win the sixth race. I knew, he, Pete said, you're going to stand it? I went, don't be silly. We want it to win. We're desperate for this horse to win. If this wins, we're made. All right? And he looked at me. Anyway, all of a sudden, when Lock Angel won the sixth race, I think I was still winning. Not a lot. Might have been winning two, three hundred quid with the X's. I'd be level. And then I thought, here's your chance now. Here's your chance now. Food your armor quest. I had, I had horses myself with David Wintle and yeah. Norman McCauley. McCauley. Bred horses. I had my odds, what I bred, same as my number plate and everything. If I had a bad horse, David always, the late David Wintle, he always used to say to me, we'll put a, bit of, put a pair of blinkers on it, gal. In my, how many horses, Nick? You're a top, top man in the racing game, respect you. How many horses have won classics wearing blinkers? Can you think of many? Not many. Not many. 
I mean, Secretariat and Northern Dancer, as John Gosling will famously tell you, both wore blinkers, but that's the other side of the pond. Not many. Right. Not many. And the Lascargo Grand National, that was the biggest sort of all I can Viking flagship used to wear blinkers. Viking flagship. But I thought, this is my chance here, Nick. The last race, you know. And uh, I know it was a 16 to 1 chance in the morning. I had a quick look up, blinkers. Ooh, lovely. You know. Anyway, the first bet I laid, uh, I was on the rails. And that A few day, horses have won ordinary old handicaps that ask it in blinkers, though, Gav. Yeah, but not classics. You know, I know this was only, uh, but in my mind, this was money for nothing, Nick. Mm. You know, this was my... Don't, yeah, don't forget, I was very, very small bookie, you know. Went there with no money, about three grand. That was me float. Anyway, all of a sudden, first bet, calls come up. The big... It was all... It was, you know, they was all... Because in them days, there weren't many mobile phones as well, Nick. No. Nope. You know, and the rep from calls come up. Never forget, lovely chap, Ralph Leverage. Gary, what price are you the favourite? I said, what price are you taking? He said, nine to two. Right? I thought, well, nine to two... A 16 to 1 chance. I said, what do you want? 40 grand at 9 to 2. And be bear in mind, all these bets I'm giving you, on the book that come out after that, uh, w well, I forget what you called it now, my first book that come out, uh, but I forget, my mind's gone a bit now, on the back page of that, it's mm. got every bet, it's got the Coral's actual, what they send you, the statement, 40 grand at 9 to 2 was the first bet, 180 to 40. Nick, I've got 3 grand in my pocket. <laughs> I've laid north to lose £180,000. Anyway, Nick, all of a sudden, all the reps were coming up. What price, what price of uh, Fujiyama go? Uh, four to one, 80,000 or 20, bet. What price Fujiyama? Seven or two, 140 to 40. Big ones again, corals, 40 grand. Then I laid a 50 grand at three to one. Bear in mind, I never took one bet on that race to any of the public. It was all office money for the shops, mm -hmm. running up money. Mm -hmm. well, they was, they was banging up, yeah. trouble and they wanted to get as much money as they could on it. And near me was a bookie called Stephen Little, who I think is one of the top bookies, and I've respected them all. They say you don't get bookies that ride a bike. Well, looking at me, I've never had one strong enough to take me, but <laughs> Stephen Little, if you can remember, Nick, he used to come on a bike, didn't he, to Bath and places. Yeah. And he come up to me, Stephen, I think it was 11 or 4, and he said, uh, uh, 55,000 or 20, Gary, and I thought, what are you doing back in an old Stephen? 20 grand at 11 or 4. I said, Steve, you're a bookmaker, you should be standing all these bets. And he just walked away with his fur coat on, I think, you know, what he used to wear, didn't he? And, uh, and then it went on, and then we laid another bet, nine of four, and then I was laying bets nine of four. Anyway, the actual take at the time was 660,000 I took out of it to lose 1.4 million. And the SP of the horse was two to one at the end. And the only thing is, if the race would have been delayed, if an horse played up at the start, I think I would have, well, what I did... I just lost it. I never went there, Nick, in no intentions in my body to play like that. But when I laid that first bet, I was gone. I was absolutely gone. My head, yeah, 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 yeah. Were you, yeah. How, how, how intoxicated were you by the whole experience? I just, uh, unbelievable, unbelievable, Nick, unbelievable. I had done after a BBC show with Stephen Nolan, from, uh, who does his own show. Yeah. And uh, it was on, uh, from Manchester, from Media City on Five Live. Mm -hmm. And his words were, when he was sitting there, and he went to me, and he's not a racing man, Stephen, Stephen Nolan, he's a very, very good broadcaster, and he said, I'll tell you what you did. And I said, go on, what did I do? He said, in every large person, or a word I don't really like people calling, in every fat person, he said to me, there's a thin person trying to get out. And he said, on your mind that day, you stood on that box, you thought you was at, on the end of the pier, you was at the end of the pier, and you was the comedian. Once you started, you couldn't stop. You, it's just what you said. It, the emotions just took mm. out, took it away from me, Nick. And it did. I never went there. No way in the world would I went there and wanted to do that. You know, if I'd have won a grand or two grand, I lived in a lovely house. You know, the house was worth a lot of money in them days. You know, which had to be sold. But it was just one of them. One, of, I, the emotions took over from me. Nick. You know, it was just unbelievable. Yeah. But you're. Unlike, dare I say, a lot of bookmakers now, you are, by tradition, a gambler. Always been a gambler. I said to John McCreary, the, the late John McCreary once, he, I was on the morning line, I'll never forget, I think you might have been on there as well at one stage, and, uh, and he said to me, uh, you're a gambling bookmaker. 
like that. And I went, John, all bookmakers are gamblers because we lay bet. Not now. Mm. Not now. You've got exchanges. You go to the races now. I would say 60, 70% of the bookmakers, they take the bets. They press a button before the race. It's called a green up button. And if you took 600, they'll get 60 pounds, 70 pounds, 80 pounds for nothing. And that's what bookmaking is now. It's not bookmaking. But in them days, I always thought, I was good with figures at school. I was very, very good. I got two, nearly got two O levels at school, and one was for finding fish and chip shops, and one was for finding <laughs> betting shops. But you know what I mean, Nick. But in my life, I was very good at maths all my time, and I thought that day, twenty-five years ago, I had a chance. Well, I never thought I had. I never thought I had a chance. I knew this was my time. And in many ways, even though it had a an immediately unhappy conclusion for you. It was your time. It's been it was your time. time. It's been my time, you know. Even only this morning, I said to a friend of mine, I tried to find the studios, and he said, I said, what, what are you doing? I said, I'm with Nick Luck on his programme. He went, you've had a bit of mileage out of that girl, haven't you? <laughs> and he's right, he's right. But this week, I've had everyone. Bruce rung me up, uh, you know, our boss here, and he said, will you come on and everything? And I, I was at, as I said, I was at Ascot Race Course on Friday, with Sky Sports taking, I've had all the press on all the week, which I refuse to do. I refuse to do the press because they've had it for long enough and I wanted to give you, you know, the, the full story, what happened that day. A lot of people said that Michael Tabor, JP McManus financed me. They told me to lay it and everything because I was only a very... F- but that ain't the truth. I played with my own money and, you know, you know the, what happened that day. But... uh took me a few years a few years to pay everyone out but I did it Nick I'm sort of intrigued because as you say you you had a nice life you had a comfortable life beautiful life yeah but w- was it not strange for Stephen Little and Ralph Leverage from Corals to be coming up to you and having bets of that size they were desperate to get on how confident could they have been in your ability to stand those bets given given your standing that's N- my point now you're saying something here what happened on the Saturday night when we all know Frankie won the winner? I was going to Milton Keynes Dogs that night because I had a pitch at the dogs there. And my son Nicky was the booking. Mm. I never told anyone when I got in there. I said, All right, Nick. He said, Oh, we've had a bad start there. We've done 17 pounds on the first race. And I thought, Little <laughs> do you realise where we're going to go from here, Nick? You know. But I went back on the Sunday to Ascot, right? And this, I never, it never hurt me on a Saturday. I think what it is when you, you know, if you, had an operation, they give you plenty of morphine or whatever, and you don't feel it, do you, the pain? Mm. On the Sunday, I went, went back there to the rows. I got there, Sue Barker for the BBC, and I think it was Graham Rock, who was the fantastic, he was the BBC betting expert. He was then, yeah. Who we, um, unfortunately, we lost another great, great name of the game, and uh, she said to me, what had happened today? And I said, oh, I hope we don't ride many winners today. I said, we will be in trouble. I stood there for four races, Nick. I never took one bet. People was going around, fellow bookmakers, what you just said, saying, don't bet with Wiltshire, he won't pay. He won't, he can't pay. Because he's, he's He can't finished. pay, he's he hasn't finished. got the money to pay. Don't bet with him, if you're back a winner, you ain't going to get paid. Four races I lasted, had Pete with me clerking, got back to the car park, and uh, I'd be true if I did cry. I never cried on a Saturday, and I got in the car and I thought, so what am I going to do now? How am I going to get out of this? No one's going to, you know, I was brought up like, if you owed any money in London, you paid. If you never paid, people come around and made sure they got it off you. You know, and I was brought up as a kid in the, you know, whatever, want a bit of credit in the flower game in Covent Garden Market. If I had £200 worth of flowers on a Friday, I used to pay them on the Monday. If I'd done well the weekend at the point, or the dogs, if I never, could I hold that over to the following? For, yeah, of course you can. Wilkie, they used to call me. Wilkie, you know. And uh, and then on that Sunday, Nick, I would give that to no one. You know, honestly, you don't know. I've had a, been in a, you know, a lot of ups and downs through my life, and but that was bad on the Sunday when I walked out of there, and I thought, I don't know what I'm going to do. And then I started on the Monday. I had a call from uh, one of the big three. It was William Hill, funnily enough. I'll tell you who it was. Their, their rep rang me, and I only owed them 27 grand. 27 grand, which is, I know it's a lot of money, 27,000, Still uh, a lot of money, Gary. You, a fortune, a fortune. And uh, uh, when are you going to set settle up the money, the twenty seven thousand? I said, well, I've got, well, if you don't pay, I think they give me a week. If not, we're going to take you to the rooms. It was called the rooms, like a in the racing game. If you never paid any debts, mm. they could you take your license away. 
Anyway, I got managed to, I, well, I paid the 27000 what I had to. and then how I went up, How? Up, well, I, had, I did have a savings as well. I had an house worth 660000 in them days, in Little Allwood, Warren House it was called. It's about 700 houses on there now as well, so you can imagine. But uh, it was just, honestly, Nick, it, you just couldn't, this story is just, you know, anyway, I rung up Coles, went and see Trevor Beaumont, who was the head of Coles at the time. And uh, I went in, I went up to uh, Embarking, their headquarters were, and I think it was the Tuesday or the Monday and Tuesday. He went, oh, hello, gal, come in. I've been, oh, I never thought I'd see you this. Have you ever? I said, hang on, Trev, I can't pay you. And he sort of eyes, like, I'll never forget, he had a lovely suit on like you got on, and he had his jacket up with the collar on the back. And uh, I said, Trev, but don't worry, you know, and I was explaining to him, I said, I'll sell the house. I had two lovely cars, I always loved the Mercedes car. I had a brand spanking new convertible with my own number plate on my odds, oh, it was. Yeah. And, uh, and what else did I have? I had, another, I had a convertible and another car, and I sold them immediately because I thought, if I owe anyone any money, if they see me driving around them as they say, I'm not having this. And I the, sold the house and everything, and the money that I'd sold, I paid all the small people I could. And then it was calls that were left, and he, was, he said to me, Trevor, he said, look, you're a man of your word. He said, I've known you for a long time on the race course, he said, but... Do you think you'll be... He said, I'm going to go in to see my directors here and you won't let me down, will you? I went, Trev, I tried my life. I said, it might not come up. Anyway, I paid him. And, uh, and that year, I'll never forget, I was working... Uh, I was even selling Christmas paper in Old Street Market in Walton stuff. It was 10 sheets for 50 pence to try to get it some money, pay everyone off. And I, I worked, at Wal- uh, worked at Folkestone Race Course and Alistair Down done a column, I think it was for the Sporting Life then, was it? Was it Ali? Probably was, yeah. Yeah, and he'd done a column, and there was a man who won the lottery there at the same time, and he had him against me. He said, in one end, we've got here, and on another end, we've got Gary Wilkes, who's trying, and he said, it would be a long way back down the mine, like working to get it back, but it took me four years to pay every shilling back. Back to a few winners in that time. You know, because I was still a fair judge and everything. I used to drive to King's Cross every night to get my racing post and my sporting paper, study the fall to see where I was going the next day. And I uh, did back Norton's coins, though, at 201 <laughs> when it won the Gold Cup. But uh, it was just, it's a fairy tale. But honestly, what you said, Nick, that day made me. It made me as a person, you know. Uh, my youngest son, Charlie, he, he was born after... You know, it was just, it was, it was a, a day that has, not only has it made right, made me, and I think I was, I'm so proud and privileged to be part of it. You know, I know people won't say that, they'll think it's all about money, but in my life I've always said money is the root of all evils. I'm, although I'm a bookie, I'm not really a book, you know, if you see me out or whatever, I want to enjoy life, you know. And I was in Dubai working for BBC, it was boiling hot weather was waiting for a taxi to get to the track, you can imagine. This is before I had the gastric operation. I was 37 stone working for the BBC, and all of a sudden, Gardy, Gardy, Gardy! And someone's jumped on me back to Tory, <laughs> and it? Frankie, and he's hitting me like as if I was an horse, you know. But, Nick, if it wasn't for that day, I wouldn't be in there, would I, were you? You know, great story. It's been, a, it's been an incredible journey. Are you different, though? Are you different now in your mentality? to how you were that day in 1996? Well, am I different? Oh, I, I, not really. I've never changed, Nick, to be truthful. Would you know? still play it the same way? Uh, Would your instincts take over? I wouldn't. Oh, it's an hard one to say. I never went there to do it that day. I was just on that box, and it just took over to me. You know, and it was just... And you say about I was at Ascot. I've never been back to Ascot as a bookie in the big ring. Mm. Every year, ask it's race, too, because it's too painful. Oh, it's too painful when I drive by, it kills me, kills me. And ask so it you race get a school. feeling in the pit of your stomach every time I you went see there, the place. I went there Friday, stood on that pitch, and as I was talking, doing an interview, I absolutely choked up. I looked on the thing. I was half a furlong from home, and I remember that day when the, the uh, ask it, they used to ring a big bell coming mm-hmm. into the straight. Do you remember? Yeah. And I remember that I could hear the bell on Friday. Now it was twenty-five years ago. The bell going, and I could hear it. And I'm standing there, and I. I was choked, you know, and out of, but Ascot, fantastic, they let me go over the other side of the track for the big meeting, and I'm the resident bookie, uh, I'm the bookie for the residents of Ascot. A lot of people don't actually know, but Ascot Racecourse give a little part of that green 
beautiful green land in the middle. If you live in Ascot, you can go there. And I'm the bookie there. And the people come up, they bring me smoked salmon sandwiches and, you know, chicken wings and chicken legs every time Ascot's on. And we've got a friendship there between us, you know. And that is something that I want for the rest of my life, you know. And even, God forbid, someone said to me, if anything happens here, where would, what is your favourite race? I love Cheltenham. And they said, where do you want your ashes? You know, <laughs> and I said, well, it can only be one place, can't there? It's got to be Ascot, isn't it? Because well, that was, you know, really and truthfully, I died there 25 years ago, <laughs> but I love it. I just love the place. And But could I be a bookie there? I can't walk in that big ring. I go there. I go there, a friend of mine. Did you not have Lava. to do that when you were working for the BBC? Did you not have did to it do that? Did it after with John Parrott? Yeah. Well, I went there, me and John did it, and we was in the Royal Enclosure, and we looked up, and I could just see the Queen's box, because we was actually there. We had... T- t- Top Hat and Towers on, didn't we? And I'll never forget our producer that time, uh, Dominic, it was Dom, and he said to us, he had a go at us, he said, look at you two, what's the matter with you? In the earpiece, you know. And he said, be yourself. And I said, how can we? Because I looked up and I see Her Majesty there in the box. It was such a fantastic, (laughs) you know, don't forget, I've come up from nothing, Nick, to standing in the royal enclosure, you know, with your badge on Gary Wilkshire, you know, oh, fantastic. I still go there, a friend of mine's got a box there, and we go for a, for a day, you know, mm. we go in the box there like me, you know, and we enjoy it going there. But as a bookmaker, I proved it on Friday. I can't go. I can't do it. I just <laughs> cannot do it, you know. If you said to me tomorrow, Ascot's on, girl, there's 10 grand there, play it up and we'll have a go. You couldn't do it. I couldn't do it, Nick. I couldn't do it. It's in, just in me, in my blood, you know, I couldn't do it. And unbelievable. Where did Gary Wiltshire, the, the punter, start? <sighs> The punter started when, when I was in the market. I used to lose every day. I used to work in the, in the market. used to get me 200 quid a week, what I used to earn. Lived in Milton Keynes. Used to do me money every time. Then I got a job as a clerk at the local dog track with a very good bookmaker, Derek Burroughs, lived in Epsom. He all, again, in them days, he pulled up in a Jaguar car. You know, I used to get out, used to have a lovely leather coat on. I thought, oh, look at that, bookmaker. Then I worked for him, clerking. And uh, and then I started. Were and you then, attracted by that glamour? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was, yeah. And I think people are when when they go to the racetrack now, people are. You know, I just, I just think when people go to the racetrack, what are they going to the racetrack for? The odds are not as good as what you get online. We know that the off famous the offers that bookies do. And I just thought, oh, this is you know what we're going to. And then all of a sudden, someone sent me go and get a bookmaker's license. And I went to this is a funny story as well. I went to Finney Stratford. Uh, magistrates court to get my bookmaker's license and I think I never had a lot of money behind me might have been grand behind me and the judge said to me uh, Gary Wilkshire stand up stood up had a solicitor uh, applying for a bookmaker and all of a sudden police objection police objection what have I done I don't think I haven't done it and all of a sudden the policeman said oh you was found drunk and disorderly in Bridlington well I've never been to Bridlington <laughs> right and I've never been never been drunk and disorderly ever been charged you know and I was just about to say something, the solicitor went like that to me on the leg. And, uh, and he went, like, he said, I, my client, you know, surely your honour. I've never been to Bridgerton <laughs> in my life, Nick, right? And this is the gospel, gospel <laughs> truth, right? Anyway, the, the actual judge, he said, uh, he said, well, everyone can, uh, everyone, let's hope, he said, that w- you go out tonight when, I, when we give you the licence and let's hope you don't get so drunk tonight, he said, but good luck. <laughs> and I got my bookmaker's licence out. And that was the start of... And I'll never forget, my dad, unfortunately, he's not with us no more. And when he knew I got my licence, he said, if you last two weeks, I'll, I'll be surprised. You know? And I've lasted 40-odd years, haven't I? You know, and still now, respected... Fi- you know, when I say respected figure, but people, when we go on holiday, oh, every time Frankie comes up, as Frankie... How many pizzas you ate today, Gal, and things like that. But these are only the good parts. I have had, as you, yeah. as you know, my, my life story, I've had some lows as well, only. What's, what's been the most significant um, trough in your, in your life? And we've talked about losing 1.4 million, but as that you say... That makes no difference Money's money. Money's money. money, money, money. You, can, you can give but it back, pay it back, make it back. The worst, yeah, the worst thing in my life about seven, seven eight years ago... I picked up the Racing Post one day. I was working for Betfred, funny enough, on mm. the Saturday, because I still do. Fred Doan's been a fantastic, fantastic... Per- he stood by me. Out of all the bookmakers, there'd been one bookie 
who stood by. He run me up on that Sunday morning after. They all slated me, said I was the villain. Should have been even money, the SP of Fujiyama Quest. I was the one who went two to one. I, I destroyed the bookmaking industry. You read it, you know. Honestly, Nick, you got you like smiles in your eyes when you read it. And I thought, what? And he run me, Fred. He said, look, you don't know me. I'm Fred Doan. And he wasn't even bet Fred at that time. He was Doan Brothers. And he said, what you done, I would have done. He said, I've done three and a half million with my brother, Peter Doan, who race, owns racehorses now with Paul Nichols and whatever. Yeah, yeah. And he said, you've done nothing wrong, son. And he said, I've got my own uh, studio at the time, about a year later. And I've been, like, I was on there every other Saturday and, and different other things. But it's just, uh, things just, but the worst thing that happened to me about eight, seven, eight years ago, because I live near Melton Mowbray now, little village and everything, yeah. it's lovely. And uh, what, what, I picked up, the, on, I was driving up to Bedford and I rang up a pal of mine. He said, how you go?" No, he rang me up. He said, how you going? I said, oh, I can't back a winner. I said, this football... I said, every time I have a football bet, I always get two out of three. Never get same old story, even now. Twenty, <laughs> and he said to me, "Oh, he said, uh, I'll f- fancy a few dogs tonight." Because my my system was having dogs that led and dogs that were slowly away and ran on to be second. And he said, "I've had these forecast doubles tonight at three different meetings. I think it was Monmore, which in Wolverhampton, uh, Newcastle, Central Park, which in." And I, I went round in the uh, like I said, I went in lab books in Nottingham. I had two pound forecast doubles. And I think 50 pence forecast treble. Because if you wrote them out in different order, if you add them all up, you've got a 25% bonus, something ridiculous. But I laid out me like six, seven hundred quid. I, you know, I had to go. Anyway, we had, I think we had three up out of five. And I won eight grand. I thought, oh, fantastic. This is it. Eight grand's fantastic, you know. On the Monday morning, I picked up the racing post. One of, well, that was, I was going to say one of the racing journals, but it was a big story in it saying that. Uh, Wiltshire, the instigator of a massive uh, win in the Nottingham area. I was the man behind it, right? Now, Nick, you know, I'm a man. I'm old. I've done a million things that's wrong in my life. But I know I had to bet myself. I went in I went in a lab books and a coals and I had the one bit. One bit was a two pound a pound. And it came away. I was so delighted to win the eight grand. Anyway, on the Monday, we were going away. We were going to... Uh, I think it was, might have been just after Christmas. We were going away to Tenerife or so. Anyway, mm. get to Tenerife, wherever we were going. And, uh, but when I read that thing, and I was the instigator of it, and I weren't no instigator, I'd done it all myself. If I was going to do anything wrong, I'd put someone else to put the bets on. Yep. I'm not going to go in a betting shop. Look at the size of people know who I am. Anyway, all of a sudden, I was working for Sky at the time, Sky Sports Grounds, and uh, George Irving run me up, who was the governor there, and he went, Gal, he said, we can't have you on while this is going on because you've... Like what you've done to the bookmate. Like I haven't done nothing wrong at all. Anyway, I got I had to go to a. Sol- this, you're saying about the worst thing in my life in the last 25 years. I went to a uh, big solicitor in Lond- London. Well, not a big who worked for Kieran Fallon, who's the top man, the, the racing man. He does all the racing. For- I went there. Christopher it- Stewart Moore. Christopher Stewart Moore. Yeah. yeah, and his son. Yeah, who's there with him? Chris mm-hmm. Stewart Moore in near Olympia. Mm-hmm. And I went there and I said, look, this is. The-, and he said, are you? Is this the truth or are you? I said. Every penny, I give him all the slips and everything, and he said, "I'll leave this to me." Anyway, two weeks later, the same st- same size, what they put in the paper, was wrong. I was nothing to do with it. It was my own thing. But, and in that meantime, I never ever got my job back on Sky. Did you not? I would ever, because people had me as a villain, and I'm not a villain, Nick. You know. Bruce, you know, when I spoke to Bruce, I said, well, you come on. I'm not a villain. People, I can walk anywhere. People people want you at the race course. They'll come up to you and they'll talk to you. They'll bet with you because of what you are. And by the way, that, I think it cost me nearly nine and a half grand to clear my name. So I still lost on that day. So instead of winning <laughs> eight, I've done 1,500 quid. But that was, and how low was I in that time? Honestly, I used to walk around... Uh, where was it, Loughborough Market on a Saturday, I never went to a racetrack for 15 months. We got a lovely greenhouse in the garden. I used to sit in that greenhouse on a Saturday and not come out the house. So you say that was much worse personally. Mental pressure, the... yeah, mental pressure. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't come out the house because I knew I was treated wrong. You know, and I couldn't even, I couldn't see a racetrack. And then one day, uh, I went and bought Sharon a car to Nottingham.com. It's so funny in Nottingham. And I went to buy only an old one, about, think, about two, three grand. And I went there, and the man that come out to serve me, they called him Champagne Charlie, he owned it, massive it is now, and he went to me, he said, I'm not being funny, I don't want to sell you a car. 
Right? This is when um, the problems were like going. He said, I said, why? He said, I want you to go and see a friend of mine who's an old chap who's retired and he was a coach, like a mental coach, mm-hmm. you know. And I went, no, nothing wrong with me, mate. And he went, no, please go and see him and then when you come back, I'll do your deal with the car. And I went to see him and I sat, he had a beautiful, lovely black leather set he like, sitting there and he said to me, just tell me what's happened. I told him a story, what's happened, a different thing. And in the end of the hour, he said to me, you've mentioned that it's hard 34 times. You've mentioned how people's treated you. No one's treated you bad. You're, you're your own person. Where, where have you got a pitch tomorrow? And I said, Worcester, if I wanted to go. He said, not if you wanted to go. 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 And I come home that day and I rang Sarah and I, and I went, he wants me to go to Worcester. She said, go. I said, well, I ain't got no money. I've only got about 900 quid. That's what, you know, because like, the, go with the 900 quid. Go, just go. And I drove on to the track and when I got there, the bookies thought I was dead. It was like, it was like a read, you know, like no one knew where, where have I been? Mm. Where have I been for all that time? And I went there that day at Worcester and I, never, and I stood the first favourite for 700 quid, even money chance. Got it beat. <laughs> I thought, oh, I'm back. And from that day, I've never had a... I've been going racing all the time. And, you know, it's just... There's stories in life. And I met... When I was at Chelmsford, I met a very close family friend from a few years back, Nick Brereton, who's... Uh, he's like... He's got horses and everything. He was he had horse running that, that day. And he said to me, uh, I want to... I think he had 200 quid at uh, 8 to 1. Well, I got straight on the machine and had 200 quid back at 11 to 1. Anyway, it's 1. When he's come up for his money, he likes, I'm sorry, but I said, it's all right, I've won 600 quid on it. Different nowadays, isn't it? And he's looked at the thing, like, and I've made a great friendship with him, and he sold, he had a big, uh, big, big, big business, pharmaceutical company, he sold it up, and, we, and now he's doing it, it's called the Bredsbet Foundation, and we're doing, a, uh, it's a charitable trust, and we're going to go for horses, for grounds, injured jockeys, even the mental health, child, children's charities, and that's what... I'm involved with. So all my dream, and I had one other dream, Nick, right, in my oh. life. I always wanted a racing club, my own racing club. Have you done it now? Well, I haven't done it yet, but I don't want anyone to pay. So I want to do, do it. If I, can get, if I can get sponsored, and I think I will, right, I think I will, with a bit of luck, the phone will ring on the way home five <laughs> or six times. If I can get it sponsored, I want six horses, six dogs, mm-hmm. don't want anyone to pay any money to join it, and I want everyone to have a bit of fun because I've had so much fun, you know, this last 25 years. And now it's time for me to give back and let the people out there. Racing, you love the horse racing. You go and all, all, all over the world, Nick. It's a good game, isn't it? I spoke to Cornelius Earl. I've known him years. You know, I remember going back. You were saying about point to point. I remember Cornelius at Perth. But I'd say, I'd say there's every chance you might have laid me my first ever bet, Gary. How old were you when you were in it? <sighs> I doubt I was even in double figures. It wasn't figures. me, no. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me, it wasn't me. No, it would have been a lookalike. No, it would have been a lookalike. But we've lived, we've lived the dream, haven't we, Nick? You, know. you had all the questions written down to ask me, and you ain't answered one, have you? I've, I've just started off. Can I, is this part one of de- about a 12 past It series? would definitely have been Tweezledown. Yeah. 1980-something yeah, or other, I would think. Yeah, it's just great, you know. I remember backing your horses at Ascot. Again, probably not old enough. With Norman McCauley. That was mine, my was odds. Sweet no. Bay. No, who was the good, who was the good, hurt, the yeah, we won the Ladbroke Hurdle. Uh, at, at, we had one at, one at Ladbroke Hurdle at uh, Ascot. Who was the other horse you had with Norman McCauley? Oh, I'd loved good him. Good oh, Yeah, uh, a chemist commander that won. Oh, I called, Norman was divorced, unfortunately, because we had two horses running. We had an horse running at Market Raisin called Chemist Commander, uh-huh. and we had a touch horse that we were going to run at Subble called uh, Montague Dawson, who I bought off of uh, Richard Green. The fine arts from you know yep. from lovely lovely family, and uh, I said Norma. She went right. You're going. Do you know how up abrupt she was, didn't you? And uh, she said right. You'll go to uh, Market Raisin. Stephen Drown rode it. Our one. I see Stephen Drown the other day. He works for the Jockey Club. Yeah, right? he's a steward now. Yeah, steward for now. the BHA. And yeah. uh, <laughs> we went there, and I was sent to Market Raisin, and we, we was Norman Williamson rode chemist commander first, and Stephen Drown on that, and it was sixteen to one hour horse, and I think I'd about. 600 quid on him, but I'd spread it about 20 pounds and 30 pounds, so the price never got touched. Anyway, we was at Marcus. I said to Don, who was Norma's husband, I said, Don, I'm going to go and watch. What are you watching that for? That's a piece of rubbish. It can't win. I said, well, I thought we had a chance. Norma said it cannot possibly win. I think we won four and a half lengths, right? And uh, Mark Johnson, who works for Racing UK, mm-hmm. he was the commentator. 
and chemist commander come to the last and he said it's going to land a cost the car double for, for Bookie and owner Gary Wilkes and Norman McCauley and Don was sitting next to me and like well you know the stuff when they got home I think they got divorced three months later and because like <laughs> Don had the ump because like Norman never told him but what a life you know it's a, it's a fantastic life I've had Nick and you know really it's just lovely to talk to you know and I hope the viewers out there you know enjoyed or enjoy the little tales we tell because they're truth and you can't buy truth stories can you you can't Gary thank you so much for for, for coming to, to talk to us today your your book i am getting a lot of trouble if I don't mention the book <laughs> No, it's I'm... called Angels, Tears and Sinners. Gary Wiltshire with Michael O'Rourke. And it is, you know what um, I like about that book? Look at the bottom what Harry Redknapp put. Harry Redknapp says, if there was a king of the betting jungle, Gal would be odds on favourite from the king of the jungle. What more there do we go. want, Nick? Um, and you go back a little way with yeah, well, Harry Redknapp. My sister's husband, uh, Richard Cook, he played for Tottenham. And Harry yeah. signed him and took him to uh, Bournemouth and to play. And, uh, like, and Harry's been a you know, when, whenever you see him, I, I can't say we're, you know, great friends, but every time you see him, hello, Gal, and, you know, we've got that little bit of, well, with anyone in the racing game, you know, it, the likes of even the top people, the Derek Smith, the Michael Tabor, the proper JP McManus, you know, what would we do without JP? What would all, all racing do about, without JP? You know, I still love the Arab racing. We're still, I've been a bookie on the Arab racing, for, but unfortunately now... We've lost most of the meetings. We've even lost Newbury this year. And uh, but you know, I just I just love the game, Nick. And uh, you know, the only way they get me away from there is carry me out. Well, they, they, they'll need four stretches to carry me out of there, won't they? Uh, Arab racing, point to point, anywhere you can Dog get racing, an edge. anything we want. Anywhere mate, you can yeah. get an edge. Yeah, you going to join my club if I have one? Not Free to join, Nick. Not if you take me back to Ascot, Gary. Oh, no, no, only, we're not going to Ascot. We're never going to have a runner at Ascot. Never going to have a runner at Ascot, no. Listen, if it's free to join... We'd, yeah, be I'll lovely. Like, Wouldn't it be lovely? Put Bring me down, a bit of fun put, back. Put me down for 100 chairs. Tomo said he wants <laughs> 2,000. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if it's free. <laughs> um, and you're in, good, you're in good health? A bit of trouble with my ankle, a bit of gout and everything. But other than that, yeah, I had the uh, gastric sleeve, didn't I, that time? That was another... We haven't had time to do that. I was in hospital in Solio Hospital. Uh, diabetes, 37 stone. I suppose I had about six weeks to live. Uh... When I was saying about Fred Doan, he rung up my boy, my Nick. He said, how's your dad, uh, Nick? And he went, you know what he's like if you don't have the operation, Fred. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, a quarter of an hour later, the nurse come in. She said, there's an ambulance coming for you at five o'clock. You're going to the Parkway Solio Hospital, the private hospital around the corner. And uh, I had the gastric sleeve, lost 15 stone. I'm fighting fit now, 24 stone. And uh, loving life, as they say. Gary Wiltshire, thank you so much. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it. Gary Wiltshire, thanks to uh, all my guests today, uh, Dave Lochnan and Cornelius Lysett, and we will see you again same time, same place, for luck on Sunday, a week from now, just before the Qatar Prix de Luck de Triomphe.